Hey, people, this is episode 82 of the Option Podcast. Got Matt Olson, two-time AVP champ, club director of WAVE, and the episode starts right now. Ladies and gentlemen, ask and you shall receive because for me, I've got to give the people, give the people what they want. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Good morning to you, Matt Olson. What's good, bro? Hey, how's it going, brother? How are you? Thanks nice. for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, pleasure's on mine. You said before we got on the podcast, you're running kind of like a skeleton crew. You so uh, what's going on? You said there's a tournament in Atlanta. Uh, there's an indoor tournament in Atlanta, so the indoor people who usually help with a lot of stuff here at the day-to-day at Wave Volleyball are not here today. So I got here early, thought it'd be pretty uh, unobstructed work kind of environment, and it kind of hasn't been the case. But uh, it's all good. <laughs> I, got a, I got a nice little uh, post-it note on the outside of my door say, uh, please do not disturb on a Zoom. There it is. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, my... um. Well, my command center right now is, is an office, like in my house. So I got a four, a four year old running around. I got to make sure that door is locked, otherwise she infiltrates, which is which is okay because she's, I don't know, when you're pretty like that, you can get away with anything, you know. <laughs> she's like this long white haired thing. So Matt, tell me, um, you are the club director, probably uh, most likely the founder of Wave, right? Is um, so. I don't know, let's go short story long here, is that uh, Wave Volleyball has been around for like 20 years. Um, Approximately, I don't know, 14 years ago, I came in as like an assistant director for the indoor head honcho, Ed Machado. And then fast forward four four or five years, I started Wave Beach. So founder of Wave Beach with the current owner, Brennan Dean. So I've been out of the indoor game for like 10 years, although Wave is a large indoor club and Wave Beach is essentially the uh, beach club version of it. So I'm around it a ton, but I do only beach. Pretty happy about that. And with the exception of having my office here uh, at Wave Volleyball, I, I don't touch the hardcore very often. Very good. Yeah, I am. Um... I coach uh, 16s and sometimes 17s at Evolution. We played we played Wave a bunch of to- a couple of times. Actually, I saw Rafu. I don't know if Rafu was coaching Wave. Was Rafu one of the coaches? But last year, he was before, he was before, before, before this he, pandemic. Hmm? Yeah, he he was before that. He was doing some beach with us too. He was great, great energy. Yeah, moved and then moved to Florida. Um, yeah, yeah. Rafu's. Um, I met Rafu through Kevin McCulloch, uh, of of course, longtime friend of yours, who we all who we all know and love. Talk about people we love. Talk about talk about people huh. who can get away with anything, <laughs> right? Big Kev. Big Kev. So I yeah. met you. Um, in person at um, Huntington Beach, you were you were you you have these cameo appearances and qualifiers, right? And then you you scare the hell out of the brackets, right? Because everybody's like, "All right, good, I'm an eight seed or I'm a four seed, I got a chance." And then you'll roll up with like Matt Marder, or or in this case, you rolled up with um, Kevin McCulloch, who um, I believe later that year qualified at Manhattan Beach with. Um, with Rafu, I was I was actually his coach. I was I was help. I went to Temecula to help him prepare for that. So, so um, I want to show a fun clip just for fun, just to see what's up. Um, let's get my. I'm the DJ. I'm spinning this. So let's do this. Damn. That was a fun clip. Let's see that again. Sorry, we got it. Let's go back ten seconds. That's that's Jeremy Casebeer and Derek Olson. Beautiful on two. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a match in the qualifier to I believe to like get in or something like that. It's on center court, and yeah, the crowd crowd is going crazy, dude. There were I mean the front and the back shot. There were, there were the people were hidden <laughs> behind the cameras, right? Yeah, I know it was yeah. pretty empty. Well, it was empty because it was a qualifier, right? They I think they just got finished setting up center court, so they were using yeah. the, they were using the I court. I like playing on center, but especially qualifiers, it's like. Just crickets in that place. Yeah, I think that's why Kevin Kevin was bringing some extra noise. You could hear it even in that clip right there. He's always pretty good for that stuff. Little little raw raw on his side of the court. Definitely, and and for me, who's got a long memory, I remember Kevin kind of like dug a ball with one hand, and and Derek thought it was like a lift, like a carry. Is just like hi, <laughs> he screamed hi, <laughs> something like that. Um, those, and- two, those, those two were John the whole time. They actually got into it at one point in the match, but there was. <laughs> 
they they had been partners previously. I don't know exactly. I can't remember the details, but yeah, there was there was definitely some uh, old volleyball bad blood, if you will. And it and shows, it, like not- San, yeah, like San Francisco, uh, same thing. I mean, Derek practically climbed up the ladder on the ref. Derek gets a little Derek gets a little jack, you know. <laughs> so so I love I love Derek, and I, I'm not blaming him. He he and Kevin, all of us can can get into that. But if there's already a little bit of that, and you got someone kind of pushing, it, it it can happen. So. Well, frankly, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more. You you spend all this time physically preparing, all right? You spend all this time mentally preparing. You train, you know, with whatever group, big group, small group, iron sharpens iron, all to lead up to this very moment. And, you know, if something goes wrong or you see a call you don't like, if, I mean, how is it not your natural animal instinct to be, to be like, you know, screw you, <laughs> screw you too, you know? Um, <laughs> right, so, so... The reason why I brought up the in-person thing is because I'm an East Coast guy. I, I just moved here when, um, uh, just before uh, a couple of months before Huntington, because I'm a coach, whatever. I'm a commentator, and this is this is where it's at. And spent five years building my brand, but a lot of my friends who were um, avid beach fanatics knew who you were because of Belmar. Um, Bel, I believe Belmar, 2008, you won the AVP with. Who was it? It was um, Wong. It was Kevin, Kevin Wong. Wong. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is this is actually fun because I still have a, a big, big following for a, a mixture of indoor and outdoor people from the East Coast, um, whatever, Russia, uh, Australia, you know, because it's a big immigration population, Poland. So they're like, oh my, they're probably like, oh, cool, this is Matt Olson. In fact, I'd like, I think I'm gonna go live. Anyone wants to ask a question or two, I'll go live for like ten minutes as a teaser. Let's sure. let's, let's just click live. Anyone has any anything they anything they want to ask I'm, Matty? I'm not, not expecting much, Jay. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But cool. yeah, Belmar. Belmar was amazing. Uh, just that town in general. I went there a couple times. We had the success in 2008. Mm-hmm. But every time I went out there, the place was super rad. And I, I don't know a ton of the rest of the state, but Belmar was a pretty pretty happening spot. Oh no doubt. I mean. Even for me, I mean, I'm primarily an indoor player. I was like a 30-year indoor player, um, um, 19-year coach. Um, Well, I got an extra five on the beach now, so let's call that 24. And wow, what what an environment. It's like a party atmosphere out there. It's like, you know, the West Coast is here in spirit. (laughs) Uh, You won your your other AVP with uh, Matt Prosser, right, I believe? Um, yeah and that was like there's a pretty legit asterisk on that win if you want to call it that i have i i it's i know it's on there in bbb info but i I don't talk about that much uh meaning that it was like you're trying to get the avp back going and it was like a specialty event there was only like six teams there so technically it was a win but uh i guess volleyball technically i wouldn't call it a win but look i had a black we beat some good teams so that counts for something dude uh, come on yeah Come on, I call it a win because you ain't finished second, okay? It's well, not like know. it's not like you were third in in, in a tournament with six teams. <laughs> the well, point is, happens. you won. <laughs> even to be more, uh, throw myself into the busing is uh, <laughs> even the Belmar win. That I think the top four, maybe in five teams, weren't there. So, so right. someone's got to win, right? And yes. Kevin and I thought we were playing really well at the time, but. Uh, you know, due to the, it was like an Olympic, summer Olympic year. Mm-hmm. And so there were teams that were not there, you know, because they were pursuing the uh, Olympic birth and all that fun stuff. So, again, throw a slight little asterisk mm-hmm. on it. But, hey, someone had a win, and I'll, I'll take it if it's up for grabs. Give me my money. Yeah, give me my money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, you know, Phil and, <laughs> Phil and Todd weren't here. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> give me my money. Someone got it. But I think it's good for the sport because it also gives a chance for other people to come up and other people to get name recognition. And, and, and I mean, part of having fan participation, part of having good sponsors is having uh, a group of uh, personalities here and there that lift, that move the needle, that lift, that lift the sport, right? There's people like Phil that don't say a word. His player does the talking and that's more than enough because he's a blocking machine. There was Karch who was like the technique king before he got a little, became a little bit older and started tearing down net systems and catching fits uh so so but but somewhere in between you got you got to get some of these people the, these people up like 2019 hermosa beach right no alex Kleiman, no ross no stockman no no uh kalinsky no um and betsy flynn emily day they they cleaned up but think about this chrissy jones uh came she was on the podcast last night 
um, Cal Poly, you know, played for Todd her last year and then was at the University of Washington. She came in at the qualifier as the 47th seat and made the semifinals with Muno. Yeah. Jones and I was Muno. there that yeah. and, they, um, played, they played very well. Yeah. Oh, well, that was my birthday, so I was there too. I was also um, – um, Earl Schultz, the guy with the afro, him and um, Jake, Jake, Jake Garudia's coach, and I um, coached them into the qualif- the main draw. So, um, so that was my birthday. Got them in the main draw. Went to Tower Twelve, which is formerly known as Fenner's um, karaoke competition. Hundred bucks, won that that night. It was it was a good weekend. Uh-huh. All of my friends <laughs> chipped. All of my friends chipped in for an umbrella table on center court. So I was I actually physically watched. Um, physically watched Chrissy and them beat um, Maple and Kraft, the, um, who were 16 at the time. David Lee, former indoor player, 2008, made the semifinals with Rosie. So so when, yeah. he, when like the big fours, what I call them the big fours for the men's and the women's, um, do not show up or three of the four don't show up. I'm always curious. Right. Who's yeah. who's going to who's going to who's going to take the stage? Miles Evans and Avatar. I, I remember they made a finals, um, and that was a great, great coming out party. It's always gonna, and I guess what the point I was trying to make is somebody's absence is someone else's coming out party. <laughs> sure. No, it's every, you know, I think it's every three and every fourth year it's gonna happen because these teams have to go travel internationally to get their Olympic berth. And mm-hmm. like you said, sometimes it's only two teams gone, but I mean, I've seen as much as like four or five and even six. So yeah. it's just gonna happen. That's cool. Um, but, you could just yeah, shake it. Good stuff. You could just you, you can wake up your picture. There it is. Um, is yeah, so, the sound stays. No, the sound stays, but the picture every now and then has to be wakened. Um, you've you you have a vast you have a, a huge huge uh, array of skill set players at the the highest and the lowest at wave. And that's the thing I like about your program is it's just about it's about people, you know. And I mean. Kids are gonna go off to college. Some, some, some are doing this. I'm like, hell no, I don't want to go to college. I just think this is fun, <laughs> you know. And I, I yeah. really, really like Wave because they, they provide this environment where everybody's, everyone's treated equally. This is, this is what I get from talking to some of your coaches, and certainly, certainly talk to you. I was doing the beat for, for um, volleyball one on one the first time I interviewed you. It was you and Todd and a whole bunch of other coaches. Um, and, yeah. th- and thanks for that too, because like a lot of people, I don't, I don't have time or whatever. But, but um, I, gave, I gave them all a coming to Jesus moment two years ago, and I'll tell you later on the podcast, because I think you get a laugh out of it. So, what's one thing you like about coaching juniors i know you could coach adults sometimes and i know sometimes you play and you coach indoor what's first of all what's one thing you like coaching beach more than indoor and what's one thing you like coaching juniors more than than like young adults or adults let's start with the the beach and indoor sure uh i mean to be honest just being outdoors is, is way better for me it just kind of I think i have a pretty decent balance in my life not so much this last week but in general where i'm surfing and whatever else but being outdoors is way better for me i whether it's add or adhd or something else so it really wasn't kind of known when i was younger like i have a hard time sitting in one place and i feel like indoor you're just kind of like right there uh, you know, especially coaching tournaments and whatnot, where the beach, I can just roam and I can just do my thing. And I, I like being kind of spontaneous and kind of loud and just like, you know, whatever, giving a compliment three courts down or whatever it is. So it kind of just plays into my kind of, I think, just social and kind of verbal skill sets. Um, and then I just, I played indoor at a pretty high level, just a club. I played club in college and it was a pretty unique yeah. program. But Arizona, so I right? Ex- yeah. And I understand it all, but I also feel that, uh, you know, I, I have my expertise is in the sand. So just communicating at all different levels is so much easier for me in the sand. So that's a big, for those two, that's a big thing that came about. And I just, whether it's the, the really young ones in our program, we've got like third through 12th graders in our program and all, all levels, like you mentioned. And I feel pretty confident at every level we have and just kind of depending on the day or week, or whatever, I kind of bounce around which courts I coach. And just li- I like that flexibility and that variety of athletes versus, you know, you mentioned 16s or 17. So let's say I have a 16s team for eight months. I'm with the same group for eight months. It's just not not really my jam. No, I get that. For me, the thing I like about coaching beach is um, the parents. 
the parents and coach and indoor juniors the parents are like freaking 90s rappers man they walk around angry all the time <laughs> they sit in there mean mugging people you know in the chair check the score score so and then on the beach now nah, they're chilling they got the little wine bottle in the bag they're eating sweet potato fries they're under the umbrella you know how you feel <laughs> i'm fine mom you know what i'm saying so i mean <laughs> so there's also this sigh of relief of of the general logistical thing of of not having a bench on the beach, right? Because playing time is is very important to in, indoor indoor boys, indoor girls, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so so that's already knocked out. No bench on the beach. Your daughter's going going there to play. She's going to play a hundred percent of the time. She's going to have fifty percent or seventy percent responsibility because um, something kids learn uh, that adults should have learned years ago is there's no such thing as fifty fifty on uh, on court as far as control. Does you got to give up some control? Or you got to take or if there's someone like you who's interchangeable. You know, Chrissy Jones, very same thing. I had talked to her last night. Someone who's interchangeable. That's good too. But so that's one thing. I have parents. <laughs> the parents is. <laughs> I think the parents. I think the parents is definitely mellower on the beach. Is a great way to say it. And I agree with all the things you said. I mean, mm -hmm. there's. I can't even. I wouldn't say any names, obviously. But there's some that you know their coffee cup doesn't have coffee in it most of the day, and I totally yeah. get it. And they're just doing their thing and. Mm -hmm. it's cool and it's it's i think parents can still be like just club sports in general so you're going to deal with parents at, at some level but i gotta imagine indoor especially the higher levels like you know the ones teams you, you got a whole nother level of parents involvement too so um you know it, it comes and goes but that's a good point and, and you mentioned it the no no bench on the beach i think actually your club or former club endless summer has has coined that phrase which i really like yeah but uh, I reference all the time. I just did in a phone call yesterday that, uh, you know, it's all about partnering. So on the beach, partnering is the big hurdle because everyone, I mean, you can refer to it as dating or whatever, but everyone wants someone that's as good as them or better. And if everyone in the club's looking for that same athlete, it makes it really tough because when we try to pair somebody up, if they perceive that other athlete is not to their level, they're like not interested. So yeah. We always say, or we say often that uh, partnering for us is what indoor deals with, with uh, playtime. That's like, I think their biggest kind of hurdle, especially now that they've got, you know, 12, 13, 14 athletes on a court for indoor. I didn't mention that. I really don't like that side of it. <laughs> so I, I try to keep, you kind of mentioned it, but everyone equal. And you know, to be honest, it sounds terrible or maybe cliche, but trying to keep everybody happy. And so by not having tryout, like regular tryouts, not having playtime to deal with, and those those components gone it makes it really easy to run a really kind of fun training environment with the club and if i got to deal with some you know partnering issues here and there it's it's so much smaller and smaller scale of issues than what i think indoor you know really competitive indoor clubs deal with on a regular basis i yeah i think on a general level never mind coaches but uh, and uh, program directors well, i think we have we as human beings want everybody to be happy <laughs> you know what i mean any every decent human being i ever talked to just wants everyone to be happy and you know you can't please everyone you know you can't make everybody happy but but beach beach uh, is a lot closer to that direction towards towards um uh perfection slash happy slash happiness or the pursuit of happiness if you will i i, I would agree yeah, yeah. Yeah, endless summer. The thing I like about endless summer, like me and Duran are on timeout right now. Whatever we we had a we had, uh, we had a little fun spat about how I, I do my podcast. Um, but you know, 80, eighty episodes later, it's not just a volleyball podcast. It's got legs of its own. I got actors, I got theater performers, and some of the content is let's just say not for kids. But but volleyball players, I've always kept it neat and clean for Eugene. So that was that was part that was my deal. Cause right, cause. People like you, people like Dane Blanton, the uh, the the age demographic is always going to be young, um, more attractive, right? Club players who want to play at USC, uh, kids who want to play for Wave. So, so, um, but Duran, the thing that I liked about her, and this is the other cool thing about beach volleyball, you can. It's very much like theater where you can join a big program and network you know and play and you know play for uh, uh, coaches with a good reputation and this and that, or you can play like 
endless summer is smaller groups more personal attention it's like one coach for like every three players or one coach for every four players and in essence duran's i i feel like she's she's losing money carrying like a, a, that that many coaches and that few players but but it was part of her mission statement but i think it's important for both for kids to make that choice like kids will want to play with new partners but they still get good coaching and they get to practice in three and, and bigger groups and 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 it just keeps and it just keeps moving along you know or you know, sometimes you're going to have some coaches that stop the show, which is not our favorite thing in the world to, to, to make sure they learn something. But but as sure. someone who studied theater, my BF, I was in a BFA program at uh, Marymount Manhattan. Uh, I made that choice because I knew each classroom would have um, 12 people, you know, and each, you know, and each year I think is kind of like, and the grad program at, at Brooklyn is like, 12 actors, three directors, instead of like Pace, that's the actor studio running that. That's like 54 actors and 12 directors. So, so um, where's the most interesting place you've traveled? I'm going random. I'm going to go random uh, away from club for a minute. Um, I went to China. I went to San, Sanya, China. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that terribly, but Kevin Wong and I snuck over there for like the last FIVB of the season in, I think it was 2009, I think. And I'd never been to China before, didn't know what to expect, and it was it was really interesting. And I think where we were, it was like an island off the mainland, so it was even probably a little more unique than, I think, mainland China. But, uh, I mean, that's just the first thing that came to mind, and just more so a lot of, like, the cuisine I remember. I remember, I'm never going to forget, like, going by the little, like, street kind of markets right along, the like, the main highway, and, like, they have, like, literally, like, I don't know, 50, 60, like, fish tanks, I'd describe it. And, like, literally, you could, like, pick out what you wanted to eat type of thing and that just <laughs> just blew my mind so kind of some of that i think was pretty cool and um you know it, that that's the first one jumped to mind I, i've been quite a few places but um as far as just unique and different uh, you got to go china no i like i actually never been to china i've been i'm ex-military so i think it's safe to say i get around i got around too but ch man china china this you're not the first person to tell me that and i'm like Dude, I'm going. <laughs> my, my sample size was small, so I feel bad. Like I was just in like one little specific town, mm -hmm. but it was pretty unique. But and, think, but yeah, but think about a bunch of yeah. all the people that are well traveled that have never been though. So I mean, why, why the hell not? You know, I'm, I, yeah, I mean, I've been to, you know, I, well, I was in Germany station in germany for two and a half years so but i wasn't like um a homebody i made sure we got in the car and we went everywhere you know i went to italy i went to france spain i went to switzerland you know um uh took a boat to morocco <laughs> yeah kuwait whatever for three weeks too i mean i was i was at the tail end of desert storm I, uh my my class graduated two weeks after the ceasefire so i wanted to I, I bounced there or whatever but but um yeah i was just curious because i know wong's gotten around and i know you you played with him for a little bit so and i know you had um some success with him you you were you're always at the scene of the crime with the semifinals and the finals so and and, and it was something i wanted to bring up and, if, and certainly for the people listening to this podcast yeah you know, who, who wong, wong was like he's just the most experienced partner i had and just being the big blocker he was it was it was great mm -hmm. so that was super fun experience and before i forget like thank you for serving for one i appreciate that i respect that and uh, i did go on a visit the trips visit the trips visit the troops trip um in i don't know maybe 2007 2008 somewhere in that same time mm -hmm. where i went with uh ryan mariano nygaard and uh the time brooke brooke niles right but it, was, it was amazing and we yeah. that was a pretty unique trip saw some pretty crazy stuff on that trip too <laughs> So, yeah, Ty Loomis is um kind of took took the reins from you guys a little bit. He's the one that's been doing a lot of that too. But that's pretty yeah, cool. I only, I only went the one time. It was the only time that was offered to me, and uh, I took advantage of the opportunity. And um, you know, I, to be honest, I was a little starting to get a little nervous as the the date was approaching. Mm -hmm. And I I didn't have kids at the time, but I you know knew newer wife at the time. We've been married for quite a while, but right then it was you know it was pretty fresh. And it was like, whoa, like, where am I going? And how long am I going? And, you know, it was, it was, it was impressive. So really cool opportunity. You got to meet a lot of amazing people. And we ran like little clinics at all the little bases. And it was, it was, it was pretty cool. How many kids do you have? You got a little tribe at home? Two. Okay. <laughs> just two, two. Girls. <laughs> Me? <laughs> seven and nine. They just turned seven and nine. God bless. Two weeks ago. Yeah. So we got first, first and third grade. And, uh, 
yeah, I'm going to have my hands full here in years coming. I got two little cuties. Yeah. And they're doing, they're doing real well, happy and healthy. And they like school despite, you know, some distance learning and online learning and, and in-person learning too. So it's been an interesting year like everyone else. No, no doubt. Like mine is four and I'm, I'm glad I got the woman. I got the woman in my life because we really need, Kelly, my, my wife, to protect her from me. Like I'm 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 a old school Brooklyn person. Like girls don't leave the house. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, of course I've evolved or whatever, but instinctively we're overprotective. You know, she don't get sure. to date till she's like 40. <laughs> you know. <Yeah. laughs> so, <laughs> You know, someone visits the house, wants to see. I'm like, come here for a second. Let me talk. Let me talk to you for a minute. Come here. <laughs> come back. Um, but um, all right. Hey, let's talk a little bit about that. Where were you when they started shutting everything down? This is all right. This is like March 2020. And I ask all of the, all, all of my guests um, who are coaches, um, you know, where were they when they had to shut down? Mayor Mayor had an interesting story. Dane had an interesting story. Um, floor is yours. I don't think mine's too interesting, to be totally honest. Um, I was just here in town in San Diego. I live in San Diego. Our club's in San Diego. And my partner and I, he's the one that runs the indoor. He's partners with me in the beach. We were just in town and keeping an eye on it. And to be honest, like leading up to like our like legit, like, all right, we're shutting it down. Uh, we just didn't think it was happening. And I think, to be honest, I mean, I've watched the news so much more now in the last year. At that point, I was just you know, very tunnel vision on my club and my family and just keep an eye on what's going on. I had heard about the virus and this, that, and the other, but I just didn't quite understand the magnification of what was going on. And I was literally driving to work, meaning to the beach club, and just, just called me and I went in and they already started a board meeting and it's literally like, all right, uh, catching you up, Matt, you haven't been here for the last 20 minutes, like we're, we're shutting the club down. And it was just, I remember just like walking in and it's just, just the, um, I didn't know exactly that we'd be out for three months and everything else obviously has transpired since then. But at the time I was like, wow, okay. And just, it wasn't, I don't know. Even now me just talking about it is still, it's hard to like wrap my brain around that kind of day and how everything went down and looking back and we can talk for hours about everything that's happened and the differences and the mask. And I mean, where do you want to start? But uh, I was just in town and just totally caught off guard, even though I was kind of keep an eye on it. And then, I think my my club's done a really good job, especially through the indoor side, where we've kept up our, you know, we're doing weekly Zoom meetings or bi-weekly Zoom meetings there the whole time during the shutdown and just trying to keep, um, you know, keep paying our coaches to the best of our ability and being communicative with our families and, you know, just getting by like everybody else. So it was, um, I think yeah. we've learned a ton and definitely some silver lining through everything, but uh, it's a lot, lots happened the last year, a year, I guess you're slightly no, year plus now. Definitely, like John, was on his way to play Grand Canyon. John Mayer, who, um, for the, oh, sorry, the audience listening, John Mayer, head coach of um, Loyola Marymount University women's beach team. Um, I was his assistant, you know, in 2018, 2019, I was his DO, his DOO. And um, he said they were gonna play Grand Canyon and when it, everything shut down, he got a call saying the game is off. So he's sitting there actually just trying to negotiate with the airline to get his his people off the plane, you know, because he didn't see any sense in flying there and then just flying back. So, and it's so weird and that watching because you if you know where I live, I live in Hermosa Beach. I live um, basically north of the pier, six blocks up the hill. Just nice. seeing them band off like string off the strand, right? The, the, the yeah. strand is strung off because if you open the strand, that's a zombie apocalypse, even with people with masks, people walking their dogs, you know, people on like these high tricycles, God knows what else you've seen, you've seen it all. And watch, yeah, yeah. just watching from a yeah. distance, watching the beach and watching the strand shut down is just like you said, the most bizarre thing I have ever seen, Matt, in my life, in my life. You yeah. guys practice on the beach, right? Yeah. How does your beach look when it shut down? Did you get it? Did you get like a visual? They, so yeah, I'm at a really small beach. They call it North Beach. We all kind of refer to it as Dog Beach. But I, mm -hmm. about that same time, I got a call from the lifeguards who control our permitting down there, and he told me that I had I can't remember what it was exactly. I don't want to exaggerate. Let's say 24 hours. It was a little less, but something like that. That I had to remove all the volleyball poles, or the city was going to come down and literally just cut them in half. He's on my side, but cut him, cut him in half because they didn't want to deal with it, and they were just going to get them just off the beach because people were still 
trying to play even though the beach had shut down. So it's a little after that initial shutdown. And so I went down there and we removed almost 20 sets of poles, so 40 poles and stacked them up all nice and neat on the side. And that was it. So the beach, I had some photos from back in the day, but just obviously just dead flat, no poles. And our beach is a small little, I don't even know what the size of it. I mean, it fits about 20 courts and they're, they're tight. Some are using the same pole for both nets type of thing. And it just, it looked like you said, zombie apocalypse. I mean, it looked, had that kind of a, a feel and there was something refreshing about it, but that I've been there living here for so long and you never, you don't see it like that. Yeah. It and was to, to hear that they were going to cut them down. It was like, Whoa, <laughs> it was, Hold on. I mean, for me, who's, who's in the volleyball and theater, it was like classic theater, of the absurd. It was classic ex- ex- absurdism. I was having a waiting for Godot. Like a Beckett moment, just this this desert, you know, empty. Is anyone here? Is anyone alive? Uh, um, I feel like for for people that don't know what absurdism is, it's basically a circular action where like every act, you're right back where you started from at the end of the act with a slightly worsening condition. You know, the the, mm-hmm. the only guarantee that it's not going to be the same is that's it's because it's going to be a little bit worse. And, that, and that's how that's how it felt. My goodness. And they took all the nets so there were nothing but poles you know whatever because yeah. and then because of the beach was walled off no one's gonna whatever but a lot of it changed when i think a lot of the, the state department of health departments of health understood what beach volleyball was um i had for example i had a guy named brian mcdermott he's a, a chicago coach right indoor sand um and i forget it's not he's not he's not the prime sand coach he's someone else but he made national news just because he had an indoor beach facility and he was in constant communication mm-hmm. with the, the state health department because state health departments that don't know about volleyball they think there's six people on six out there you know and there's a bunch yeah. of courts and it's like shit loads of people right just just trail loads of people just just being super spreaders and when you when those people understand it's doubles when people understand, especially on the beach, it's ocean to strand, wind just going in. It is the epitome of uh, of, of a safe sport to play during a pandemic, as long as you don't touch each other. Um, they yeah. started to ease. It was the sport that started to ease, ease in a little bit better than indoor volleyball or basketball, or just like multiple competitive sports. You know, I mean, you you look at golf. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sure the wealthy, they, they didn't, sh- I mean, it's a wealthy sport. They didn't shut down. That's that's social distancing. Um, tennis, right? You know, I mean, the the, the commentating team literally is literally in the bunker. <laughs> Not figuratively, literally yeah. in a bunker. So, so there are ways that we can create these pockets and then for multiple sports, create a bubble. The NBA, I thought, was, was quite ingenious, just creating a bubble. I thought that was the, the best idea. It was, it that's was... Yeah, yeah, it was the measuring stick which everybody should have been compared to. Yeah, AVP yeah. did kind of, kind of a quasi bubble, like a poor man's bubble, because a lot of these, a lot of the people live together, and they train together. They don't really migrate outside when they're training. They don't migrate outside their circle. A lot of them are roommates, right? Eric Baranek and Urango were roommates. Yeah. Or, I mean, Troy Field. So, so I was very happy that we 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 as beach volleyball coaches and players just found a way to be to to make it work. You know, I mean, we have, of course you have to go smaller, but it is yeah. what it is. Who are yeah. um, some of the coaches uh, you have on Wave? Because I, I, that's something I didn't ask before, and I want to come back in, and we can plug them. Um, <laughs> currently, like my right hand man is Mike Plachek. Uh, everyone says Mike Plachek, but Mike Plachek. He's had a while. Well, I was playing uh, actually on the tour. He was on the <laughs> tour as well. So before the qualifier, random qualifier days, and then uh, uh, Summer Nash is another one of our top coaches. Um, and I've got some, those are the ones that have played AVP and higher level, like beach level volleyball themselves. Yeah. And then I've got a couple others, a guy named Nick Mercer and a guy named Skylar Heyman that have been with me for a long time. And so some of our regulars, um, you know, they've all got different volleyball backgrounds, but, uh, you know, they've been within our club for quite a while. And Summer's actually on like a six week hiatus. She grabbed the uh, volunteer assistant position at Stanford with Andrew Fuller. So she's actually taking a break from us right now and uh, pursuing that, which is super cool. Lauren's uh, getting close to giving birth their second child, I believe. And so Summer's going to fill in while Lauren's, uh, you know, taking care of baby stuff. So I like pretty Lauren. cool, but I like Lauren. Yeah, Lauren, Lauren Fendrick for everybody listening. That's who, who we're talking about. Fendrick. It's Andrew Fuller's wife, right? Um, yeah, correct. Yeah. 
And I'm, I I like it for Summer because a lot of the people she's, she's going to be coaching are people that she coached with and against uh, um, during the club season, during during these yeah. the the you know what I'm saying like the get notice tournaments, the AAUs, the AVP first and stuff like that. Like Hodel, I think Zolani Hodel is there. Um, she's, yeah, shees their pair one. I I, I literally them. watched her play yesterday on Pack Channel, so it was pretty cool to watch, you know. And I like I like Summer. I, I mean Fuller, I, I kind of like Fuller is. I'm gonna be honest. I mean, I, I always sound like I'm criticizing people. I, he, he's a cocky dude. I mean, I, I, he kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But honestly, like what he's doing for Stanford, I don't let my my feelings or lack thereof affect my critical thinking skills. So, all the things he's doing at Stanford, I really like what he's doing. And you know, he's he's always gonna have my respect. But I just did, you know, just trying to have a conversation with him, which I was gonna get back to is just weird, you know. I think you have a different your time you spent with John, and I think you're with Betsy too at LMU. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have a different perspective on some of the college coaches, and mm -hmm. a lot of them I just knew from back mm -hmm. in my playing day or thereabouts, and then in turn, a lot of my interactions been and just on the recruiting side of things. So mm -hmm. we do all the recruiting for our club as well. So um, it behooves me to have a really strong relationship with all the college coaches. And I just go out of my way just to be whatever, be myself and be cool and try to figure out what they're doing and have an interest in their program, which fortunately for me, I like volleyball. So it's not very difficult to do that. Nah, but of course. Uh, yeah. they're all different, man. And I, I, I do like really like Andrew, but all the coaches are different and kind of their recruiting style is mm -hmm. different. And you mentioned Dane, like you talked to Dane at USC and even Andrew at Stanford, like there's different athletes that get into those programs for, you know, academic and athletic reasons. So it's, it's yeah, well, it's student before the student athlete. Yeah. The just, like, <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah, well, they're not, they're not club players. They're student athletes with uh, with uh, yeah. uh, the operative word being students, uh, of course, you know, and and. I mean, half of them have, you know, there's probably an academic package to go with the athletic scholarship, right? There's not, there's not too many full rides for, uh, for volleyball and, and men don't even get me started. I mean, for men, there's only, they're only allowed a maximum of 4.5. So, I mean, uh, which, yeah. which back yeah. in the day when we were playing where there were, there were only like 11 man rosters. Yeah. You could slice up that pie a little bit, but now it is like 18 person rosters. What UCLA has got 22. You like that? I mean, come on. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but. I, I mean, just because he rubbed me the wrong way doesn't mean I don't respect the guy. I respect the guy, but I'm not going to be one of those people that are going to pretend to like him because because he can do something for me. That's not, you know, I, I'd probably be a billionaire if I did it that way all the time. But but I am where I am because because of my mouth and, and, and I'm not going to keep it shut now. You know, why? you know why, Matt? Because if I did. And if and if I'm kicked out on the outside looking in, then I've compromised my own integrity, and I'm still not, and I'm still not, you know, still not mesh. So I, I lose two ways. So I'd rather lose my way if I'm a lose. But John Mayer, John Mayer, beautiful mind, and one of the best human beings you'll ever meet. Also, the way his mind work is is his mind works. Um, um, Aaron Mansfield, who was the indoor women's coach, who was his assistant at the time. Betsy yeah. Flint, she 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 got a little feisty in her. And that's cool. And I've already, I've already out of one person, so I ain't gonna do say nothing bad about her. But she is magnificently competitive. She is, yeah. I mean, Team Fire and Ice. When her and Kelly played together, I, I, I could, I could, I could tell you right away who was fire. And it's what make it was. I mean, it's what makes me a fan of her. I love watching this girl play. I met her in Mexico before I even came to to California. Her and John. She's she's a she's a gifted yeah. athlete for sure. Yeah, uh, I like what, I like. She should have play. played with Kerry, dude. Dude, yeah, I'm, I'm, with respect to Brooke Sweat, yeah, volleyball. yeah, with respect to Brooke Sweat, that was, that's your poor man's Misty May right there, man. Like uh, um, Betsy Flint, Carrie, that would have been that. Yeah, that would have been a rat. That's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so we're in the subject of players right now. Who's the guy that you had the most fun playing with? It's it gets competitive. I know the training series and this and that, but who is the guy that? You go out there and you go to a tournament and you're like, why am I smiling so much? It's because of this guy. Who's the guy you had the most fun playing with? Well, we said earlier, Kevin McCullough is a very fun player to play with. Uh, he and I have always meshed well. We've run like mm. like a more of a dynamic offense than I've run with a lot of other players just because he likes doing that stuff. And I thought that was really fun. Um, but to be honest, I started smiling. I thought took a second to think about this. Is The guy that got me on to her is named Jimmy Nichols. And he's a less known guy these days, but he's, uh, I'll give him 5'10". I don't think he's quite there, but I'll give him 5'10". He's a shorter 
man for the beach volleyball game and just extremely gifted, like the gnarliest hand eye I've ever seen. And just his ability, he called it the chopping down trees, but just kind of going at any, any money plays. And he's obviously playing pretty much, you know, blockers that are all whatever, six, four and above. And just his ability to go at them physically and then talk <laughs> the most trash I've ever seen of anyone the whole time. Just one of those guys, you dig them like, you know, you miss the next dig. He gives you the never twice call. And he's always sitting there, John, the ref and just saying some people can't stand him. And I, I respect that. But I grew up with the guy, same home beach. And so I always saw him doing his thing when I was a little kid coming up. And then he gave me the call. I think he told me at the time, he's just very blunt on things that I was like fourth on the list. As mm-hmm. I'm like, uh, I think I was a senior in, in college and I was trying to break into the tour and just begging him to play with me. And uh, he got me that year, I don't know, 2004, which is forever ago now. Uh, we qualified for the first three events and then played the remaining, I think, nine on the tour with him. And it was super fun. Like, yeah, we lost sometimes. It got heated at times. But for the most part, I just played super loose and just enjoyed the experience. So yeah. kind of long-winded answer. But uh, I'm going to give the nod to Jimmy Nichols on the most fun partner. Yeah, Jimmy, look, it's also a testament to how uh, versatile you are as a partner, right? Like, I've had partners with great personalities like that. And, and the big line, and I'll summarize it without being too long – um, if I talk Ash, back me up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Have my back. Don't be one of those guys. If I jaw back and forth, and the next play they serve, they ace you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So because it, it makes it look like that all of the act, their activity is is causing their partner to lose focus in this and that. So so what your answer it had to be long because it made uh, the it made the audience and it made the people appreciate. Um how versatile you as a part versatile you are as a partner right there's an old saying big waves crash for every five points you get too emotionally high you give up nine on a low but every now and then there's someone like Nichols, there's someone like fallon I, I fallon for moana i mention her all the time on my show she's one mm-hmm. of those girls that stays high yeah, she uh, starts high and stays high but she has to have a partner that can ride that wave with her and not and not drown in the water so so again once yeah. again comes right back to you testament testament to you who's um the best conditioned athlete you've ever played with best conditioned uh, athlete <clears throat> yeah i'll just i i'm you're like me <laughs> no definitely not no no definitely not uh, i think i played with jason i played with jason ring for the majority of the season and just his phys- physicality was i mean the way just super yoked appearance wise and his ability to jump and everything else um, I didn't see his workout, so I don't know what he was doing on the side, but that guy, I mean, physicality wise was incredible. Um, I feel that, uh, Kevin Wong had a lot of gas in the tank. He it, kind of the opposite. And I'm sorry, Kev, for saying this, but wasn't the same like yoke chiseled frame, but I, I was with Kevin for two full seasons and watched the time he put in and it was rare. That guy was gassed in a match and maybe it's because I received a lot more serves. <laughs> But he, uh, dude, he, you know, he's, he's built for go, man. There's some people that are built for show, and there's some people built to go, man. Kevin McCulloch, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, Kevin McCulloch is built to go. <laughs> In fact, let's go. Hold let's on, take another on, look on. at him. Go ahead. Kevin McCulloch's close. I was actually referring to Kevin Wong. <laughs> oh, Wong. Kevin, sorry. Kevin, Wong. Whoops. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> Turn the camera off. Turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off. <laughs> Oh, put it back on. No, Kev, Kev's, Kev's no Wong. Too. Okay, wrong Kevin. Kevin wrong. Wong was like yeah. all day, every day. But I've he never. He would call me. I wasn't like if it was a day off and they was taking the day off and yeah. going and playing. Like he was, he was about the routine and he didn't think. You know, he said, "What was his thing? There's no shortcuts." That was his one he always yeah. used, and like I, I thought it was pretty legit. I thought about it quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Where yeah. Jay Ring was popping, uh, he called him Ibu's, but ibuprofen and Red Bull before games. Like you wouldn't see Kevin Wong doing something like that. <laughs> oh my but goodness! It worked for Jay Ring, and the guy jumped fifty inches and like pretty darn gnarly. So yeah, you know, well, different different style of training and preparation. But Wong can go all day. Wong can go all day, and it's so crazy that I, that I thought of McCulloch. And the only reason why I thought of McCulloch is when I was helping him him and Rafu prepare for Manhattan Beach. Uh, they qualified for the draw. They had to qualify, and then they lost the first round, and then they won five straight matches. 
in the, in the in the contenders bracket, and I mean, you know, yeah. tough matches. They had to play the Baumgrens. They eventually lost to uh, Todd Rogers and Stafford Slick, which was Todd Rogers' last tournament. Um, so, and he didn't look tired. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He didn't look tired. Yeah. We know Manhattan Beach is deep sand. We know Hermosa Beach is deep sand. And if you have a and if you have a smaller a small gas tank, the whole world's gonna know it. So. So, but it's. I'm sorry, I got the wrong Kevin, but it's. You're right. We no, got. No, no. We got to give props. Got we got to give props to both. Out. Yeah, we got to give props to both. So, dude, Kevin McCullough is. I mean, it's nothing. Not taking anything away from him. I just mm. spent so much more time with Kevin Wong. Kevin mm. McCullough is an absolute grinder. Yeah, that guy is like his zero. He's a funny dude, which you and I both know. But yes, it came. There was zero zero excuses. It was it was go time. And yeah. that guy, I've been down some, you know, we've been down big in some games and it's not, not over in his mind. So he I should, have already mentioned, I very, I respect the way that Kevin McCullough. Dude, he should, he should go to all of the SOBs, like South of the Border Vacations. Like they, they have, yeah. uh, they invite six pros. He, sh he should be first on their list because he, he his knowledge and the way he shares the knowledge uh, on from a volleyball perspective and yeah. just a fun guy to be around, his his one-liners, his sense of humor. I'm, that's where I met him before I moved to California. My wife was there for the uh, for the tournaments. I was there just to chill, you know, exhibition, like indoors versus the pros type thing. So I got to play with Ty sure. Trambley, got to play with John Mayer, got to play with them as my partner. So that was the, the, the best vacation I've ever been on my life. But Kevin was like, yeah, I'm short armed, you know? He's like, God, I got screwed. He says, look, I'll show you, right? <laughs> and he, he uh, shows yeah. me. Oh, yeah, I heard it. He shows me, and on the normal level, yeah, he does have shorter arms, but it was worse for me because I, I'm the one that has that has this freakish wingspan. Like, I'm 6'1", but my wingspan is 6'8". So when we're matching arms, you take mine, which is like, for a curiously long for like someone my height and then kevin's who's short and everybody was just like whoa what the hell t-rex you know so but he um ali how about that great couple great marriage two people that deserve each other as far talk about great chemistry scout you seen that yeah. kid little big head little big head oh, yeah. big headed oh, child yeah. i mean that is that's that 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 that, that rank that reeks kevin mccullough <laughs> so and there at uc davis Right there at UC Davis yeah. right now doing their Davis, thing. Yeah, and, both um, their Coco. I think Kevin's a volunteer assistant now, or maybe it's uh, yeah. moved into a paid position. I'm not sure, but Ali's head coach. Yeah. He sent me photos. It was during the pandemic. They went pretty hard at their house and were, you know, clearing the walls and open, yeah. like, open, you know, open style living and all that. So he's, yeah. he's a handy dude, too. I respect a lot of things about that guy. No doubt. I think we're all working our houses, right? Like, my wife's a gym rat. Yeah. I, I'm not a gym rat. All of my training is ex-military. So if I have a duffel bag with 40 pounds of clothes, if I have a set of stairs, that's that's how I roll. I'm 50 years old yeah, and, 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 and I'm 50 and that's work for me. So I had to basically convert half of our garage into a gym where we could still park the cars. And when she wants to work out, just like park the car out. So the, the garage has got a monitor, you know, you, you know how we use like the stair, that little step for uh to put up the nets the step is like for jumping jumping purposes uh, um yeah. there was a stereo system that got replaced and then i fixed the old one so i put the stereo system in the garage so i set up the garage kind of like a mini gym so this and that so um all right so let's talk about because i know you god knows you you got somewhere to go and i really really like my time's valuable but what you're doing today i think your time's exceptionally valuable no, so thanks for this time is valuable, um but yeah Let's give me give me the last good one here, buddy. My phone's about to die. All right, let's talk about. I want to talk up. about controllables. All right, so what's? I have John and I had this great debate and agreement and disagreement on controllables. So, what's three? Give me two or three controllables on the court and two or three controllables off the court. And when I say controllables, things that your players are always going to be able to control more than the other team or control more than the, the, the ref or more than the, um, more than, um, the, 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 the weather, the conditions. Like, for example, me, my on-court controllables are serve, right? 100% controllable. Um, in system setting, your partner gives you a perfect pass. The other team can't make you set poorly. And the third one is like down ball, free ball. So those, to me, those are examples of like on court controllables. Um, what would be like your I emphasis think, yeah. on controllables? I've got two slash two and a half that came to mind immediately. I think your preparation is uh, one hundred percent a controllable. I think it's two parts. So I'll give it two parts to that where it's, you know, the physical conditioning kind of back to the Kevin Wong kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, what skills you're working on. Like if, you know, I'm getting 
my partner's getting served because my setting is tragic, then it's controllable for me to work on my, my setting, you know, in the downtime or in between tournaments or matches. So that's a very controllable skill. Um, and the other one I thought of too is communication. Um, I hit this at the junior level pretty hard because I have a lot of athletes that are just newer to competing and it starts getting tight and they just start just clamming up and getting quieter. So regardless of the score is, I know it's not easy, but you can still communicate to your partner both, you know, for set preference or whatever else, but just your ability to uh, communicate on the court, regardless of the score or the weather or your opponent, like you can control your communication and try to keep that consistent and comfortable between you and your partner and, or, you know, what your coaches have you work on or your club. Um, and the other one I think, which at the junior levels missed quite often is it's controllable to call timeouts and just game management. And again, when we start losing everything else oh, that can go God. sideways, but you're, yeah, you know, cause you've done the junior level a lot. I'm just coaching in general. Like, you know, it can't be, you're going down by six points, seven points, eight points, and you don't call a timeout and, you know, pause the action. So yeah, you call time out at 19, nine. I'm like, so yeah. ladies, what do you want to talk about? You want to talk about Game of Thrones? What are you, yeah. what are you talking about volleyball? Like my favorite. Mm -hmm. They wait till they wait. Cause I think it's when they, they realize that the opponent has game point against them. They're like, Oh shoot. Like time out. And it's like, like you said, the damage with you know, our current rally score is the damage is done. You're not going to yeah. be able to make up maybe three or four. If it's like a miracle yeah. beyond that, I mean, Good luck. Dude, we're going to have – we're gonna because we're going to have another conversation besides volleyball. Let's talk about Game of Thrones. Let's talk about Band of Brothers. Let's talk about a good pizza joint because at 20 to, 20 to 12, we ain't talking about volleyball anymore. <laughs> I like that. Very, 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 very good. Before we go – and and this this is cool that we, we we get to do this an hour. I mean, Dane and I went an hour and a half, and Brian McDermott and I went three. So some sometimes you know sometimes we catch fire. Yeah, we gotta get for two on the books. Today was a today was a tough day. Yeah. I wanted to I wanted to hold our hold our date. But, Matt, uh, you whole, you a hundred percent. The world's collapsing around me right yes. now. Yes, dude, you a hundred percent have to come back on though. This is you yeah, know yeah. this is an incomplete conversation. I had a whole bunch of questions. Who's your what partner's your biggest drama queen? But that's probably. I, but since you said oh, Nichols, yeah, what you said about Nichols or whatever, I was like maybe that's a two and one. You know, um, favorite place to play tournaments. That was that was a that was like a quick question and this and that. But all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it with that one, Jake. Because I think it's important. Yeah. I think that Manhattan Beach, I've been all over the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost literally, but yep, that's Manhattan it. Beach is my place to play. I feel that the deep sand is a great equalizer, and it wasn't always to my benefit, but I think it's a great equalizer yeah. in just beach volleyball mm -hmm. and just the history. I still, to this day, even the six man, mm -hmm. I still walk the pier every single time and watch those that are, take a look at those that have, yeah. you know, the greats of this sport from back in the day. I just think the history. Of Manhattan Beach, like, is unparalleled. And I yeah. know some people in Hermosa, and maybe you're there too. Like, you know, Hermosa's got a ton of amazing history as well, but I still think Manhattan. It's the Mecca. It. And I just, I just yeah. feel like when I, when I was getting ready to prepare for a tournament there, and you get down there early, and it's just crisp, and it's just beach volleyball's happening. That place, that place is the place. And fortunately, I feel like I had some of my better tournaments there too. So, like, I have that memory. But that place, like. I don't know. For our sport, I've referred to as like the Wimbledon of our sport, and you know whatever whatever your sport is, the 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 creme de la creme or the primo event. I think Manhattan takes the cake for beach volleyball. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the only the only beach tournament I've ever played in my life. I played in when I was forty seven years old. I wanted to there play. Be, I wanted to play one just one before I got too old because I I was I was a late in the house beach guy. I played with Tyler Lucas and um, lost lost to Jake Rosner and TK. Um, and that was it, but you're right. It is the true Mecca and this is a true pleasure. Okay. Um, plug in wave volleyball before we get out of here. And I'm going to, I'm going to say, bye, uh, so we're going to say bye to everybody. Plug yep. in, plug All in right, the site. Well, Jay, thank you so much for having me. It's wave. There you go. How's there it, it is. All right. For everybody at home, we're out of here for Matt Olson. This is episode 82 of the option podcast. We're out. Come check out the Option Podcast on optiondb.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports Handle. You're going to love what you hear.